invasion of your privacy that's probably one of my probably one of my favorite records of that whole era um you made some great rap records with out of the cellar invasion you did what five records with them four which which one did you not do detonator detonator okay okay um so i thought it would be fun to talk about invasion of your privacy today sure Okay. And one of the things I wanted to ask you was because last time we spoke, you told me you got fired after every rap record. Right. Right. So you got fired after out of the cellar. What brought you back to do invasion? Really one thing. Uh, Doug Morris, president of Atlantic, who kind of, he discovered me, gave me my first shot. And I felt very obligated to him and very loyal to him. And so even after a 4 million selling debut album, I get a call. I think I'm, I may have even told you this, got a call from my attorney and he said, have you seen billboard this week? And I went, no. And he said, okay, well on page four or whatever the fuck it was, um, Rat just fired you. They, they don't want to use you on the next record. And I went, hmm, that's interesting. And uh, a little bit later, I got a call from Doug Morris's office. And secretary said, hey, uh, can you talk to Doug for a second? I said, of course. And he said, Bo, you got to do this next record. That's it. Or I'm going to drop the band. And so I said, Doug, of course, I'll do it. And then, you know, we also, because of the, the, uh, spiritual pain and suffering, uh, my points went up, my advance went up everything, you know, so it was, there was a little retribution in there, but, uh, it, it worked out at the end. What was the energy like when they first walked in the room to do invasion and you were there? Well, okay. So the, here was kind of the sequence of events is I do the record, they say horrible stuff about me in the press, and everybody assumes I've been fired. I get the call from Doug. I say, of course, Doug, I'll do whatever you would like for me to do. I'm so grateful and so thankful for your support. And then uh, the band will pick up the phone. They'll say, hey, dude, you want to go out for sushi tomorrow? Just the two of us. Let's just talk and kind of get things going. No problem. So I had five sushi dinners and uh, a lot of sake. And uh, so when we showed up for pre-production, you know, we were all kind of, everything was copacetic. We were, we were good. You know, they vented what they wanted to vent and I absorbed it and took it all in and figured out, okay, I need to approach this a little bit differently in this way, a little differently in that way. Can you, can you, if you don't mind me asking, like, was it, was it the way you would speak to them or, or like, like you delivered them a game changing, not just for them, but for a whole genre of music it, it, out of the cellar. You, the, you gave, you handed the world a game changing record. What, I, I I need to understand what they, why they weren't, bowing at you bowing down to your okay that's a that's a very great very direct question and i think i have the answer for it um in my opinion the guys in rat didn't really like each other that much robin was the glue that held the whole thing together again in my opinion i could mm -hmm. be wrong but my opinion and one of the big sticking points was that I chose all the songs that were going on the record and everybody in rat thought that they were a better writer than everybody else. <laughs> and so you can imagine the clusterfuck that that sure. presented to me for every record. I mean, it was like, I, I was getting these, I was getting demos, you know, from Blotzer, demos from Juan, demos from every everybody, you know, just junk that they're doing on the tour bus or while they're sitting at their house or, you know, cassettes of little vignettes and ideas. 
And I had to go through, filter through all that mess and go, okay, I think let's pursue one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, and 14, 15, and things like that. So at the end of the day, a lot of people in the band were really mad at me before we ever even started anything, just because I didn't pick their song. And, and it was ego involved. And then there was, ob and, I, and I don't, I'm not exactly sure how they did their publishing splits or something like that, but there was probably an economic component to it as well. Sure. And so, you know, half the band was mad at me all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but that, that's my job. I mean, I have right. to go, I have to say, okay, what's going to make rat the strongest album to compete out there with Van Halen and White Snake and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And I made a lot of decisions that made people really unhappy with me. I get it. Do you, do, so, you know, do, you, do you know of a producer named Richard Goddard? Do you know who Richard is? Sure. Richard produced my first record. Oh. And me and the singer at the time were songwriters. And what you're explaining happened to us. I wanted my songs on the record. The other guy wanted his songs on the record. And Richard, at the end, most of my songs are what got picked. But it does create a tension with artists. It does. it does. But I was so young and so eager. We Our band was so young and so eager and just so grateful that we had a world-class producer making a record. I put all my faith in him. If he would have uh -huh. all of Ryan's songs... I mean, if you remember the guy did Blondie and the Go Go's, he wrote "Hang on a Sloopy." Uh, sure. I, to me, he knew everything. Why would we not trust him? And I guess in my brain, I I would assume that that's what they would have thought of you. And you know, you just brought up something that that is mind blowing to me. I and I never thought of this. It, 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 I am such a rat fan, and I'm such I'm a gigantic rat fan and a Bo Hill fan. I've never known who wrote the songs in rat i don't know why i never even thought about it and for you to say that they came from all five different guys that makes what you did even more incredible because you made cohesive records that sound like all those songs came from one spot well and and in full disclosure i was a i was a contributing writer too oh right on right on but in the but where the where where the whole project starts was like me with a desk full of cassette tapes of, you know, a riff. Uh, I mean, it, it was a real, uh, how can I say it? it was like, it was like beef stew. You know, somebody gives you a bowl of beef stew and they say, okay, take out all the carrots. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so that, that was my job it was, okay. I would listen to all these ideas and all the guys had, you know, several great ideas but it was me trying to go okay so i i have to i have to make something sensible out of all of this stuff and so i really disciplined myself and i said okay we're not going to get political with this you know we're not going to go for favoritism we're going to go for a professional product we're going to go for something that is going to put these guys on the map and put me on the map too. I mean, I, I was, sure. uh, you know, involved in that as well. Gotcha. And so I think that that was the real um, impetus for most of the hard feelings. But as I said, yeah, I, and I couldn't make it any plainer. Half the band was always mad at me all Man. the time, no I matter what. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I get it. Joe, I have, it, it's funny, Bo, yesterday I said to Joe, I said, I don't know what to ask Bo Hill. Like I, I and now I have, I have <laughs> five days worth of questions and the floodgates are just coming. Hold on, Pete. I do want to ask you about when they did give you the songs, did they present you with full songs or did, were there ideas, just little guitar riffs? I mean, how did they present them to you? 99% of the time it was an idea. Okay. Um, and so going into Invasion, since we'd already had some history, 
I said, look, here's what I need. I need verse, chorus, bridge. I don't give a shit about the arrangement ideas or, you know, I'm going to, we're going to fade in this or we're going to have like gunshots or whatever. I said, just give me a skeleton so that I can listen to it. And if, if the meat's on the bones in the skeleton sketch, that's all I need, 90 seconds. Right. And, and then if there's something in 90 seconds that blows my skirt up, then I'm going to say, okay, now let's develop this one or this one or this one or this one. So we kind of had it, you know, condensed down to a manageable uh, way for, for them to present it, a, a volume of work to me and for me to be able to go through a volume of work and not wind up 90 years old at the end of the project. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I saw a thing with Warren D. Martini the other day, actually, and he had said that a lot of Out of the Cellar was done before he even joined the band. The songs were written. Um, and it, some of that was written by Jake, Jakey e. Lee or the when he was in Prior to Rat. Is, is that something you were privy to or knew anything about or, or? No, I wasn't. I wasn't privy to it. Um, no, not at all. I, it, it was when I first was involved with Rat, Warren, I mean, pardon me. Uh, Robin was roommates with um, who's the bass player in in Motley Crue? Nikki Six. Oh. <laughs> right. So Robin was living with Mickey, and and, um, and Warren was nineteen years old or six or eighteen years old or whatever. So there was a lot of like weird, you know, incongruent things going on there. Right. And so I. I wasn't privy to any of that in interaction that, that they'd had. And, and don't forget, at this time, I was a, a nobody, and they didn't give a shit about me. I guess. And they didn't, and there was no history or there was no, wow, we got Bo Hill to do our record. Mm -hmm. They didn't, they wanted the- uh, I get it, guy, I get it. Yeah, they wanted the guy from uh, Iron Maiden. I don't even know. Funny, I'm an I'm a Maiden fan, and I've never thought about who produced right. it. I never even right. thought about it. Uh, but but let me tell you, I have this thing that I say all the time. I would love to hear your opinion, and sure. and and know how this how you did this is the one thing I say. Everyone always wants to talk about what's wrong with the music industry today. Every, always, you know, and the one thing I think is missing is that when you what we used to have was a band whether it was the beatles kiss van halen rat they got signed and you could hear the rawness and they grew as a band and the fans got to grow with them the way it all works today you can make a world-class sounding record your first record sounds as good as your last record is going to be because the tools are there and most musicians are it's different now and in the rat records, like you said, you produced four of the rat records. So you were part of that growth. There was out of the cellar, which was mind blowing, but invasion of privacy was in an incredible step forward in maturity, in songwriting production, even the album cover. Right? It, it was you, there was growth with a band that doesn't happen today. If you know what I'm saying, the band sure. you get now is the same band that they're going to be in five years. Um, and, so, especially with Rat's drum sound, that drum sound was you know, not not that you think you're tough. EP, mm -hmm. I, I I don't I don't even remember that to be honest with you. But the out of the cellar record, moving to invasion, it's just like it, it's exactly like Van Halen one to Van Halen two. It's clearly the same band, it's clearly the same producer, but you felt the growth and. Did you do, is that something that you were doing on purpose? Did you get, did you get better at your tools? Is that why Invasion sounded so much better? Because you got better? Did, did, do you know what I'm saying? Well, how did mm -hmm. that growth go? But yet it was still 100% rat. <laughs> is that a cat? That's my cat. <laughs> nice. Say, say hi to Wyatt. Hello. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was phrasing good at. Okay, so 
Uh, Pete, great question. Um, yes. Uh, I had done probably two or three records between Cellar and Invasion. And once Cellar took off and I, and I went, okay, so I may really have kind of a career here. It's, I, I'm really, I owe it to myself and to the audience to get really good at my craft. So, um, yes, Invasion was the, um, uh, was the result of the three or four albums that I had done in the middle. And I continued to try to push the envelope and push the envelope and push the envelope, not only in engineering and mixing, but also in my, uh, my quest to gauge the marketplace, see what's working, see what's not working, and, uh, and deliver on, on that level if that makes any sense to you at all. But yes, absolutely. I was on a quest because I, I, I listened to my records with the, with the harshest ear you can possibly imagine. Right. And, and I'm just like going, Oh my God, you know, you owe them their money back for that guitar sound or whatever it was that was going on. Um, did you no, feel, did you feel at the time that you were creating cutting edge drum sounds? No, not particularly. Uh, honestly, I, I I didn't. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something that I, I don't think I've ever said in an interview before. I never trusted the record business during that time. Here's the reason why, is that there was so much money, so much everything. It, it was a tidal wave of of, I mean, unbelievable. The guys from Rat before Seller had nothing. They were broke with the exception of Warren. Right. And then after Seller, uh, their manager told me that they each filed 1.2 million in taxes for that one year. Taxes. Wow. I hear yeah. you. And so, so that'll give you a little bit of perspective of how off the charts and crazy the business was for that 10 or 15 or 20 year period, which is really unusual. Yeah, yeah. Tremendously unusual. Right. And so I, I felt obligated to take advantage of the window of opportunity while it was open and to deliver the very best and to push myself and challenge myself to make each record a little bit better than the one before. Sure. Lay it down. We all know that it became one of the single most iconic guitar riffs in history. And to this day, almost 40 years later, kids learn to play the riff. Um, but that moment, when everything kicks in and the bass and the drums and everything come in, that is one of the most powerful in the pocket groove moments of the 80s genre. And I'm just curious, as they were playing that, did you hear that? Did you feel that and know did you that you had created that? It was like it was like you were on a battlefield and a cannons were going off in rapid fire. And to this day, it still holds up in the car and everything. And I'm just curious when you would hear that, did you know that's great? Okay. Well, I'll give you a little history lesson. Rat was touring Cellar and they were playing in front of Motley at the Beacon Theater in New York. And I was living in a uh, illegal warehouse conversion in New York because I was I was absolutely as broke as a church mouse at that point. Yeah, yeah. Even though even though I had a gold record on the charts, uh, they don't pay me until six months later anyway. Sure. I know the feeling. <laughs> okay, so I was broke. And Warren came to my to my place and played me a cassette of that opening guitar riff that he had done on the bus. 
And I went, that's it. That's our single. All right. <laughs> you knew right, right away. Right away. I knew it. Nobody played anything. There was not a, a word said, no drums, no nothing. He played it on a cassette. And I said, that's it. So to answer your question more directly, no, I was not at all surprised. Gotcha. gotcha. And the, when it, it had that that power and that impact, but because I, I just knew right away. Right. You know, I right. would have had I I I couldn't have fucked that up. There is no <laughs> way I could have fucked it up. I, I hear you say that. And ironically, years and years ago, maybe 16 years ago, uh Rat was again out on tour as Poison's opening band, and I was out on that run. Uh, me and Brett were working on a, a new record ourselves, and I was out on the tour. And uh, and Warren had gotten a laptop and Logic Pro, and he couldn't figure it out. And so at the time, their bass player was Robbie Crane. I don't know if you know Robbie, but um, I uh, Robbie came and got me. He goes, Warren's in the dress room, and he can't figure out how to do anything. He bought all this stuff. And he can't get it to make a sound. And everyone says that you know how to do all this stuff. Can you go in and show? And I was excited. That was the first day of my life that I met Warren. And uh, and after I showed him a little bit of, of logic, uh, I said something to him. I, I was blown away because he was such a good guitar player. And I remember saying, I said, that riff, lay it down. And you go into that augmented nine chord. And he goes, I don't. I didn't know that's what that chord was. And it blew me away that he wasn't nearly <laughs> as educated of, of a musician. And, and it was all about feel or whatever. But uh, he, Warren's feel is so, is so magic. and But it's still just a guitar riff. You created that song. And and I know, I know what it's like to be a guitar player and songwriter. The special part about Lay It Down, the riff is great, but the special part about that whole song is the dynamics. And you were able to create dynamics that a lot of hard rock bands didn't have back then. That verse comes down real low. So when it gets back to that chorus, it's giant. I mean, that's Def Leppard, Mutt Lang shit that didn't happen for another five years. And it was happening on the Lay, on lay It Down. And uh, did you have to pull those dynamics out of them or, or, or did they understand that? Well... Uh, not taking anything away from those guys, um, I arranged all the material, mm -hmm. and and so it was it was in that arrangement framework. Uh, I am, uh, and, and I don't I don't say this with any like uh, with any uh, egotism, but I I was trained classically. Okay, and. and Part of my training was, uh, you know, orchestral um, arrangements. And so I just kind of had that lurking in the back of my head. So part of the way that you make your chorus in the rock world um, impact is that you have to make everything else in front of it smaller. Sure, right. Bigger. And so, you know, I just kind of applied that logic that was sitting in the back of my head that had nothing whatsoever to do with a rock band, but it was just kind of the way that I filter through stuff. Right. And it was like, okay, I need this chorus to melt your face. Yeah. So how do I do it? Right. Okay. I make everything go away before the chorus. Yes, <laughs> sir. Yeah, yeah. It's great though. You 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 made history. I don't you seem humble. It feels like you don't think you did, but you made history. You <laughs> you you know, I know a lot of people throw Lang Mutt Lang's name around, but you were making those sounds on those rat records long before he was making those sounds. <laughs> and and uh well I, I, again you're too kind and I really appreciate <laughs> it. But it was yeah. and, and, a... and and I know we're jumping records, but you you did um you did uh, Reach for the Sky too, right? Yep. I mean, I want a woman. What a gigantic! It's just hook laden, and I know that you know. Anyway, but so, Joe, do you want to go on to the next song or, or bring something up? Because I can't just keep going. <laughs> let, let me ask you this, Bo. When it sounds like you had a lot of involvement with the arranging and, like you said, of the songs and stuff, was there a lot of pushback from those guys when it came to moving things around? 
On occasion, yeah. Uh, especially during cellar. Because, you know, they're sitting in a, in a studio with an a absolute nobody. And they're going, why the fuck should we listen to this guy? Sure. So there was a lot of lobbying, a lot of cajoling, a lot of, please, guys, let's just try it. If it sucks, I'll be the first one to say that that, that, that idea sucks and we'll move on to the next. So there was a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And then after the success of Seller, that obviously that lessened. A little faith. You no, know, the temp the temperature went down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it was like, okay, we still don't like this guy, but he did sell four million records, so I guess we ought to at least listen to him for a minute. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so, yeah, you know, it it, it was those guys were not. Uh, uh, pushovers at all. I mean, they weren't like, you know, I walk in, you know, like I'm high and mighty and go, okay, guys, here's what we're going to do. And, you know, I, I, I would say, hey, look, let's try this. Let's do this and this and this and this and this. And they'd go, okay, you know, we'll try it. And then sometimes it was, would work. Sometimes it wouldn't. And sometimes I could tell that they didn't want to make it work. And so I'd go, guys, Let's pretend like you really give a shit and let's see if we can try to make it work because I, I'm hearing something at the end of the day that might be beneficial. If it's right. not, I'm going to be the first one to say bad on bow, you know? Right. So right. It, was, it, it was always like that with those guys. How about and, the, how, I'm sorry, yeah, yeah. How, how about um, the guitars with Robin and Warren? Um, did they, work well together in the studio or like did they have their leads all set who was going to do what and or did they just determine that as you were recording for the for the most part we made decisions like that in pre-production i was i'm a big fan of you know let's go to the hot sweaty garage in burbank at 25 dollars an hour rather than you know sure. this the studio so we had 90 I'll say 95 percent of that kind of stuff was all sorted out in pre-production because I never booked the session to make the record until my pre-production was done I had to know I had I had the record in my head gotcha. and then I would book the studio and we'd go in now having said all that half the fun is all the shit that you never planned for that will happen in the studio and you have to be flexible and you have to be nimble to be able to capture that you know so if somebody has some like weird moment of genius that i hadn't foreseen and they hadn't foreseen i want it i want to get it and so you know we always had to stay nimble with that kind of stuff but for the most part, deciding solos, who was doing what, and all that kind of stuff, that would happen in pre-production. Now, did we make changes uh, during recording? Yes. Uh, you know, if somebody just was having a bad day, and I said, "Look, I need, I need a four-bar fill at the end of verse two. Okay, anybody? <laughs> and. Uh, you know, so we we would do we would have to do things like that because I I had a certain schedule I wanted to get it done, and I needed to have certain product at the end of the day. So, yeah. I guess my kind of loose answer is yes and no, but primarily yes. I mean, we knew Warren was going to do this solo, uh, Robin was going to do this solo, and then they were going to do their little harmony thing here. And that was kind of the general architecture of, of what we were doing. And were they planned out the leads that they haven't planned out or did they just go for it in the studio? Um, all of the harmony stuff, they that was written. Um, and then the, uh, the regular solo stuff, I think Robin would do his, would, write his or organize his mm -hmm. thoughts on that uh, in advance. 
and uh and warren was just he was just amazing all you had to do was just turn him loose <laughs> it's just, just like it's, okay it's, i'm gonna go get a cup of coffee and so when i come back will the solo be finished <laughs> that was kind of it warren is very special that feel is one in a million man like like the way he plays you know i not to take away from from uh lynch you know lynch became i i think a more iconic guitar hero type of guy they had very similar techniques in to me but warren just had a, a soul to that metal feel that rivaled edward if you ask me it was his own thing but it it, it was it, I, i'm a gigantic warren fan that's all i can say we can and tell. Rob. <laughs> you know <laughs> you know but so you know, Bo, I've already, I've hinted this, hinted at this a couple of times, but I'm dying to, to know those drum sounds are, are just, to this day I make records. And I remember making a record in uh, 1996 for some band, right in the middle of the grunge era. And I, I remember putting, uh, 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 with the way cold junior record on and i know we're talking about invasion but and i'd be like let's make your drum sound like this to this band that was in wanting to be grunge <laughs> you know what i'm talking about and uh i i'm i've always it's it sucks because like i said i bet i've had a weirdly strange relationship with blotcher himself so i've never even spoke to him about any of this stuff um but did you hear that were those drum sounds something you, that were buzzing in your head and you wanted to get out? What were the influences? You know, guitar players talk about, I like Jimi Hendrix. Were you, was there another drum sound you heard that you were trying to borrow from? Where, where did those those sounds, they were so fucking big. W was it in your head or were you borrowing from someone else that was an influence to you? Um, definitely choice A in my head. And the way that I approach all the recordings in general is I begin mixing on day one. So as I'm recording, as I'm selecting mics, as I'm compressing, as I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I'm doing everything with like, what kind of nightmare is this going to create for me when I mix this record? <laughs> right. or, or what kind of beautiful experience am I going to have when I'm ready to mix this record if I record it right per song per album per band whatever so I always had an idea in the back of my head of how I wanted the end product to to sound and so I kind of disciplined myself to make sure that okay I want to point it in this direction and with the drums for for rat that was a real priority to me because i needed the drums to fill a particular space in the middle and i because i knew that the guitars with with robin and warren were going to were going to take that outside space i knew that was going to be no brainer but it was how was I going to record the drums and mix the drums and present them uh, in a way that wasn't going to um, detract from everything else? So a lot of it was mic selection, EQ, uh, performance, you know, to make sure that there was enough space for everything to speak and not compete with each other uh to create that kind of cluttered up mess right mm -hmm. and again that you know that just came from my classical training was like you know one guy speaks the other guy takes a breath the next guy speaks this guy takes a breath so it was kind of approaching it in in that way within the rock format yeah yeah i, I have to assume but i'm probably wrong i have to assume that it's the the old lexicon reverb but what is that what you used on those records i used whatever was there i got you uh lexicon ams i mean mm. uh, 
I'm not necessarily, a, I'm not a big fan of reverb in general mm -hmm. because I find, I found it very difficult to control when I mixed it. So anything that would give it that space and that air without having to go to reverb, that was my go-to direction. So, so go ahead. So again, like at the beginning, I lay it down, ticka tacka, ticka tacka, ticka tacka, or, 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 uh, you're in love. Are the are those sounds room mics? Are you telling me like that's not like like super processed verbs? You know what? I would I'd love to be able to answer you truthfully, but I don't remember. <laughs> that's the best <laughs> answer that could be. Well, uh, either either way, they're they they either way. I love them. That just I just love I love I, all the drum sounds. <laughs> but again, like on the beginning of Lay It Down because there was nothing competing for space. Yes. So I could have done reverb. I could have done room mics. I could have probably done a little bit of all of it. And it didn't sure. matter because it wasn't getting in the way of anything else. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I gotcha. How, you know, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead. How, how you mentioned performance earlier. With How was it working with Plotzer in the studio? <laughs> Glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just curious because I've heard I've heard from people who have worked with Poison and Motley Crue and, you know, and I hear Ricky was hard to work with. And then I hear Tommy was pretty well, easy. I just to work said with. that too. <laughs> <laughs> so I was just curious, how was it working with, with Blotzer? Uh, next question. <laughs> That's my answer too. Jeez. No, I mean, listen, uh, like with all people, I, I, I must be fair with this. Uh, Blotzer had his good days and he had his bad days. And it, some days he was super prepared, super confident, super ready to go. One, two, three, go. Boom, 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 boom. Thank you, buddy. Out you go. And other days, uh, if there were issues or other energies or things like that going on, it, it wasn't very easy. Yeah. And, I, you know, yeah. I don't. I have a lot of issues, Bo, to be honest with you. He he went out on tour with us and uh and he because Rat took poison out on their first tour, Bobby has this kind of uh Bobby has this kind of attitude when he has to open for Brett, if you you know what I'm saying? And uh yeah. and I also act as the tour manager as well as the guitar player out there. So my problem is every night I had to tell Bob to come off on time and he would look me in the eye every morning and tell me he was going to come off on time and smile at my face at that last song, knowing that he wasn't coming. So, but as a drummer, I don't want to take anything away from him. I don't know if it was you telling him what to do or, or his own creativity, but there are some really, really unique and creative drum licks and fills and stuff. Yeah, it, he, he was solid on those records. Yeah. And, but I've made, Bo, I've made a lot of records with a lot of drummers. I, uh, the producer is the drummer ninety percent of the times, and that's that's a fucking fact. And and and, and it's true, right? <laughs> Not that you actually oh. play the drums, but you know. <laughs> well, um, you know, B Bobby and I would work together, and and I would say, okay, look, here's the kick pattern that I want here. Here's here's the snare pattern that I want here, and uh, you know, and a lot of times like especially in the outros of, of songs when the band is really grinding away on one riff mm -hmm. and everybody is just grinding on the same thing. And I would say, okay, Bobby, go outside on this one. Okay. This is like the moment that you can perform play across the bar line. You don't have to like just dumb rock it anymore. Yeah. yeah. Band is going to hold it together. You know, the bass and the guitars are right here. You're yeah, right. in love, don't, don't, you're in love. They're not going to move. Yeah. So give yourself a vacation and go play some cool shit. Play some shit. Yeah. You, you said you're in love. Let's move to that song. What a, what, it, just like Lay It Down. It was gigantic. Did, did you felt that right away too? You knew that one was, a, was a smash? I, I knew that that was going to be a hit. But Doug Morris selected that as the first single, which really pissed me off because I was a I I was lay it down all the way. Well, you were right. That, that was the one 
Well, because I wanted, I, I, I liked it was a little darker. It was a little slower. It had, it had a lot more uh, color to it than a regular rat song. And so I'm thinking, okay, Bo Hill, genius producer, I'm going to go out and I'm going to like conquer the world with this new song from Rat Out of the Cellar. Yeah. So I kind of had my own, my own game plan. Right. And Doug overruled me. You know, he, he called me and he, he said, what's the first single? And I said, it's, it's Lay It Down without question. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> You're in love. And right. I was just like, Doug, please, come on, man. But he, he, and he actually, he did it, he did it right. I mean, uh, You're in Love was a hit, and then he pulled Lay It Down for the second one, and that was a hit, too. Lay right. It Down was special. It just wasn't the way that I wanted it to be. Yeah. yeah. You, 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 you know, uh, other songs on that record, I, I listened to that record today, obviously, in, in, in excitement of this, and I remember as a kid waiting for You Should Know By Now to be a single, and it was never really a single, but what a gigantic pop hook in that song did, you know, and you say you picked all these songs or whatever. Did you, did you feel like that one had the potential to be in, in that, in that same realm or you didn't feel like it was as special as, as lay it down and you're in love. I didn't think it was that special. Um, but again, back in those days, there, there really was a, uh, what am I trying to say? There was a, a methodology towards the life of the record. And so just based on, on history and what was going on with, you know, MTV and all that other kind of shit, if you got up to your third single, you're in high cotton at that point. Right, right. And so that was my mission is like, I got to get to my third single. Got to get there. Got to get there. Got to get there. And, and then, you know, if, as long as MTV hung in with us, which they certainly did. And as long as, as the band was on tour and, and selling, you know, stadiums around the world, I was going like, yeah, we're going to send the kids to college. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah, there was I, only two, only two singles in the U S off that, right. You're in love and lay it down. There wasn't mm -hmm. the other one was in Japan or something somewhere else. There, I, I'm sure that there was a third single that was released in the U.S., but it it, it didn't have any staying power at all mm -hmm. after those two. Was yeah, this I, uh, was this album? Did did Rat get pulled off the road to do this album? Like it happens to a lot of bands, you know, the success of Out of the Cellar, they want to follow it up fast. Did that happen with this record? And you had to do some quick songwriting to get some tracks or you know i hadn't thought about that but that definitely happened with warrant mm -hmm. and, uh, on uh, cherry pie and it happened with rat i don't know if it was this record or if it was dance okay that they pulled they get, were in the middle of the studio and then i remember marshall their manager marshall burrell Hey, Bo, uh, I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> what? Um, I'm taking the band's got a, it, and it was a really great gig. It was like three weeks in uh, Japan. And, uh, and I had the studio blocked out. So, you know, I'm sitting in there by myself uh, trying to finish the record, which I had plenty of work to do. I mean, a lot of niggly stuff to do. Trying to fix um, invasion or dancing undercover? I'm not, I don't remember which record that was for, gotcha. yeah. but, it, but it did happen. And it was someplace in that. I want to, I want to say it was in, it was invasion. And here's how I know, because when they got off the road, I had finished all of my silly shit I had to do on the record. And Robin flew to New York for mixing because I was ready to mix. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I said, look, I, I need somebody here to be the voice of the band. And so Robin flew from Tokyo to uh, New York and stayed with me for another three weeks or however long it was that I, that I mixed the record. So yes, it was Invasion. Gotcha. Okay. You know, 
go ahead, Joe. I, no, I'll go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. So, uh, it, again, speaking from experience, I remember uh, making that first record that I made with Richard Goddard and the the team of people at the label kept saying uh we need to make the vocals special and in my brain if i had a singer that was singing in tune that was special <laughs> you know what i mean and uh and i i never understood what they were talking about back then i just i'd be like what the fuck are you guys talking about special and they would always be like i don't know put some something effect on it or or create the uh, harmonies or you know whatever the whatever they said i would never relate that to being special or unique but now when i look back i understand differently about creating a vocal sound for a band uh that is is a technique and it's an engineering and a producing i, I clearly understand it now and so i would love you to give us some insight on how you made Stephen's voice so special and unique um you know i mean clearly there's doubles and clearly there, there there's there's stacks and stuff like that um and it, and steven has got all the swagger in the world and he's one of the sweetest guys in the world i think that guy has been nice to my children since they were kids he didn't need babies he didn't have to be that way it, it, to me steven's a wonderful human being um but but he's not um he's not rob halford vocally you know what i mean uh and and i'm curious this especially on you're in love the vocal is so large what was your technique what did you do if you don't if if i don't know if that question is something you don't want to give away a secret or anything but it's it's magic his voice on that it, you know and that had to come from production and i'm just curious what you did okay um well this was record number two so allow me to digress slightly. When we went into pre-production on record number two, it really pissed everybody in, in the band off because Steven stopped coming to rehearsal. And it was like, dude, why aren't you at rehearsal? And Steven's answer was, Bo's just going to change everything anyway. And he's going to tell me what to sing when we get in the studio. So why in the fuck do I need to waste my time coming down here with you guys? Right. Well, that's what he said. And he was right. Based on how, how we worked together on the first record, Stephen just said, tell me what you want me to sing. And to get his particular sound, I dialed it in on the first record, but we really nailed it on Invasion. Right. That's so my point. Right. Here's the way it worked. Specifically, we would do three takes of every vocal. So whenever, and normally with Stephen in particular, I would start at the end of the song, like for the, the outro, you know, when everybody's going crazy and screaming and yelling and all this stuff. So I liked starting him at the outro because it warmed his voice up. And it got that Steven texture. Just record the end three times, let him go crazy, whatever. Then we go back to, to the beginning and I would start to do the, um, the minutia of, okay, let's do this, let's do that, let's do the other. His voice was nice and raspy or whatever you want to call Steven. So we would do three takes of verse, chorus, verse, chorus, let's just say. And then I'd send him home. Okay, go home. And then early in the next morning, when my ears were clear by myself, when no one else was in there, I would go in at like seven in the morning and I would do a vocal comp of the three takes that we had. And I would put together what I called the bionic take. Okay, this is the best of what you did yesterday. And we had it. And it was like, okay, beat it. And so he'd go in, do three more takes. And so we did this for like, you know, obviously a few times, this process. So we, that we always wound up with me editing together the very best of his original voice that we could get in that performance. Then <clears throat> the next step 
of the process was his vocal double. And so at that point, I had like, I had the very best as the lead vocal, and then I, I knew where the second best was going to be. And so I, I would use that. So the lead vocal would be, say, if you're um, your engineering chops. So the lead vocal is going to be at zero. The double, which is going to be the almost bionic double, is going to be like minus five. And then for choruses and things that I wanted for impact, I would have the third vocal, which would be minus 10. So it looked like that, if that makes any sense. And that's how we did it. Great. And, and, and pitch wise, we'll see. I'm not, I don't want the, I'm not asking for the old Tom Warman, Vince Neil suck. We had to, I'm not asking that question, but was, did he take direction well with pitch and, and hey, push a little harder type of stuff? What was he, was Steven okay to work with on that stuff? Steven was really, really easy to work with. And in general, what I told Steven to do is I said, if this is the pitch, this is the note that I want that that we want to hear, I want you to sit right there on top. That's where I want you to aim for. Because, you know, he had a, he had a, a, a problem with, uh, with flatness. And so I said, I want, if this is middle C, I want you middle C plus O1. Right, right. I got it. And, 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 and we just worked until we got it. And it made sense to him though. He, he was, he worked, he trusted you to guide him that way. Yeah. I, I don't remember ever having any, any issues with him at all. I mean, he, um, but the main thing was the way that I was able to, to, to present his vocal to the band and to the label because, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, editing and nudging and fucking around and moving this here and doing all that kind of stuff. There was a lot of molding the clay as we yeah. said. Yeah. Right. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, that's the general way that we, that we got Steven and on seller, I was having a lot of trouble with him pitch wise. And so I thank you, sweetheart. And so I sort of developed this three tiered the technique, this tripling of his voice. And again, the guys in the band would be, they, they were really uh very sensitive to studio i'll just say uh trickery, trickery right and uh so you know i kind i really had to hide what i was doing i got you did you do a lot you of know, that I, kind of stuff after hours oh uh, yes i worked after hours on every i mean i played a couple of warren's guitar parts after hours just because they were out of tune right yeah. right there was nobody there and i was just like okay fuck it it's just an a chord so i'll play the a chord tune it up play the a chord and we're off to do it right. so and it, you know so there was all that kind of stuff that was going on did he know <clears throat> no <laughs> well i mean he, he probably knows now but i mean it's it, it's common knowledge these days that that stuff was done you just can't you 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 know it's it i hate to keep going back but just telling stories and similar i keep telling you about this band that i was in some odd reason we're actually performing this weekend our 25th we haven't seen each other in 25 years and we're performing the record this weekend awesome congratulations and, and i went back my my girlfriend's sitting right here with me right now i went back to learn those songs a couple of days ago and I remember saying to her, I didn't play that. Someone went <laughs> in and, and did that. <laughs> you know, and it's just common knowledge that that stuff happens. I don't, I don't think anyone can be offended because the job got done. You know, you're you're so right. And and my 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 blinders went on because this happened with Warrant too. Is that 
I am going to present the best record that I can with these guys on the front cover. I'm going to, my job is to present the best record possible. Right. And everything else fell by the wayside. I'm going to do it no matter what. And I'm not here for a population or a, a popularity contest. Uh, I'm here to do a job for you guys. Mm -hmm. So that was it. Did you bring in any outsiders for rap or no? Cause I know you did with Warren and yeah. Uh, yeah. No, I didn't have to bring anybody in, uh, in for, for rat at all. I mean, they were, they were all very, very, very competent players. Really good. Right. All of them were really, and, and Juan's a great bass player. He's going to bring Juan up. Yeah. Uh, Juan is a very good bass player and he and I did all the background vocals and he's a very good singer and uh no i have i have nothing but uh yeah th there's, good things to say about him there's some high background vocals on that record on invasion if you listen to it oh there's yeah, so. high, there's high vocals on all that rat stuff like like but but i've, I've seen juan do that do that live but you also were in there doing that stuff too well the way that i that i arranged the background vocals was Juan and I sang everything in unison so that we didn't create one voice or bow voice. We created third person voice. Yeah, I got it. And uh, we applied the uh, scrotal clamp <laughs> and got the vocals high. I mean, no, Juan was, he was great about, uh, about that. I mean, you know, he, he stayed with me note for note uh no matter what mm -hmm. and so the idea was just was not to have an identifiable single notched voice but as you added people to it and and we doubled all this stuff obviously so then it wasn't you couldn't pick out one and you couldn't pick out me it was just this background blob of stuff so sure. But he, he sang note for note everything with me for sure. And his bass playing, was it pretty did he was he pretty like good with that? It was one take, two he, take? Yeah, oh take. absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was he was a very, very, very good bass player. He came in, he knew exactly what, what to do. And anything that I wanted him to change, I said, Hey Juan, why don't you try blah 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 blah? And he goes, done. Boom, 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 boom. And it was mm -hmm. done. So he was he was very 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 good in the studio, really quick, and uh, a lot of fun. Did he dance around like he does on stage in the studio? <laughs> no. <laughs> so so what? Oh, you mean this? Yeah, yeah, and all the kicks and stuff. Yeah, no, 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 oh, no, 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 no. I would have had him arrested if he was doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Might have broke so, some stuff. So for you, for you personally, Bo, what is your, what is your favorite moment on invasion and what is when you look back is there anything on there you don't like or do you you say you listen with with such intense ears and and you're your worst critic is basically what you were saying is, is there is there anything you feel flawed in invasion that you wish you'd done different oh my god now that's that's a pretty intense question <laughs> so uh uh, 30 years plus on yes there are things i would have done differently but no i can listen to lay it down right now this minute and go man you fucking nailed it <laughs> that's awesome i'm really i'm very happy with with that uh you're in love same thing uh and then you know my next favorite would be way cool jr Right, but that was on Reach for the Sky. Yeah, that was on Reach for the Sky. So right. on, on Invasion, yes, the two songs that, that really drove that record forward. Yeah, I can I can I can live with that. I gotcha. It's funny, Reach for the Sky. That that record has so many pop hooks that that weren't singles like Sweet Elena and, and some different songs like that. I, that 
it's, it, to me, Reach for the Sky is, it is a phenomenal, phenomenal record. And, and, and Way Cole Jr., what it did, that was so, it was still rat, but it was new territory. Yeah, it was. <laughs> you know? <laughs> well, you know, we, we hired a horn section. I loved it. And, I loved it. uh, and, and I wrote a horn section for it. And then the, in the beginning, yeah. um, I was sitting in the studio early in the morning and I, and I was hearing that, you know, which sounded kind of, uh, you know, swampy, you know, Texan kind of, and uh, and I went to my second engineer. I said, I want you to go down to the uh, drugstore and get me eight thimbles. And they had a uh, uh, it was it, a a hard surface in the center of the of the, uh, of the uh, control room. And so I put the thimbles on. And I was going. That's what that fucking sound is. That's what their sound is. That's me with thimbles on my fingers. That's amazing. I've never known that. That's crazy. Uh, but that I, don't think get... I don't think I've ever shared that with anyone before. And I said, let just record, record a little piece of this. So I had the click track going on the on the master. And it was like one, two, three, go. That's crazy. <laughs> And I listened to it back and I was just like, well, that's kind of cool. So let's stick it in there. I, I That makes me ask this question. Is there anything on that record that is something like that, that we wouldn't know you did? You know, like, like I'll give you an example. When me and Brett make records, almost on every single song, Brett beatboxes. And I turn it into something that you don't think is a beatbox or I try. <laughs> and, uh, and, and there's always something I, I joke a lot because a lot of people just think Brett Michaels is a singer of poison, but when me and him make records, he'll grab shit from the kitchen or he'll, he'll, he'll just make sounds with anything. And, and he likes to do that. And, uh, it, it, you know, I'm curious though, is there anything on invasion that you did that, that we don't hear, we don't know that no one has ever thought of like, like the thimbles, like you're talking about. Um, that's a great question and there probably is, but I don't remember, <laughs> I don't remember, you know, back in those days, when we were working at the pace that we were working at, it was just like, you know, I can't wait for somebody to come in to do something. If it needs to get done, I'll grab it. I'll do it myself. Yeah, yeah. Right. Right. And, and that happened like daily. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know, not nothing monumental, but you know, just a little thing that needed to get repaired or fixed or tuned up or what what have you. So, other than the 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 symbol thing, um, you did have no. a telephone on that record. I'm sorry, you did have a telephone on Invasion. I, mean, I did. The opening yeah. to one song is a telephone ringing. What yeah. song is that? That was a. I got the record right here, actually. I don't even remember. Uh. It's got me on the line. Effect. Got me on the line. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, I got my record okay. right here. And yeah, someone saying hello, hello. Yeah, and then the song. Oh, okay, <laughs> you beat me on that one. I, I, I totally you don't remember that? that. I totally forgot. And then someone at the end says, "Nobody hangs up on me." <laughs> was that you? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't okay. think that was me. Is that your? Maybe that was your Ted Templeman moment. One buddy <laughs> coming up. <laughs> Yeah. But so, so this question just came to mind as a it doesn't necessarily have to do with invasion, but let's talk about invasion. Knowing the modern day tools today and Pro Tools and and all the stuff versus what you had, if you were making that record today with the tools you have, do you think you would have been able to make a better version of that with the tools today, or do you think that the way that came out? then is as great as that was ever going to be uh another very insightful good question uh i would have to say honestly that 
I could make a better record today with the tools available today. Yeah. The fact is, is that there were physical limitations in the analog universe mm -hmm. as you know, that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't get around. Now, yeah. if you can think of it, if you can imagine it in your head, right, you can damn well do it. Right. And so I, you know, when I talk to, to my old producer engineer buddies and they're going, oh my God, I wish I had a Studer A800 and stuff like that. And I was like, dude, are you fucking crazy? <laughs> right. Right. Because, you know, the creative domain in this digital world, since they've been um, uh, perfecting the A to D converters. So now I can't, I can't tell the difference. Right. Um, you know, maybe somebody else can that's smarter than me, but I can't tell the difference. And right. I wouldn't go back to, you know, ag for 468 tape versus my, uh, my pro tools rig. I wouldn't do it. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I got to tell you, um, I, I am a giant fan of the the SSLG bus compressor, right? Uh, the G series bus compressor, and when uh, when I joined Brett Span and and we wrote the theme song to uh, Rock of Love, and I got the biggest paycheck I'd ever gotten in the music industry in my life. The first thing I did was go out and buy one for myself, right? The the real piece of hardware, right? Oh, good for you. And I held on to it, and I held on to it, and I held on to it, and over the years. Um, you know, whether it be Waves or UAD, and now SSL makes the plug-in themselves. And I have sat there, I still do it. I did it the other day, just trying to make, I, I A-B the thing over and over and over again. And I can't hear the difference in the plug-in versus the compressor anymore. I could 10 years ago. Right, right, right. You know, but the UAD, I don't know how much you follow that stuff, the Universal Audio stuff. I yeah. I, I, so I sold my Neve preamps. I sold my API stuff, which I, I, I don't know that I should have done that because it, especially the format that people listen in today, anyway, are they really going to hear that stuff? So, so I, I'm with you. I, sometimes I wonder if the limitations were better though, because, you know, as much as I tell you that I'm a gigantic fan of you and the sound that you made, and, and and Bruce Fairbin, I'm a big Fairbin fan too. Brian Adams guy all the way through. My, Me too. Uh, but I don't even know who made the records. Uh, but the Mellencamp stuff is so different than anything I love. But I've been trying my entire life to. Sometimes I'll just record something. I go, let me try to make this sound like a Mellencamp record, and I can't do it. You were talking about. You talk about. You have the tools to make anything happen these days. There's a simplicity to those Mellencamp records and a space. Yeah, do you do you ever listen to them or have you ever heard them? You sure. Them? And, and, and and I think a lot of it has to do with uh, Arnoff playing the drums because Arnoff's a, a motherfucker, you know. But I can't create that space. I end up no matter what I do, and me and Brett laugh about it all the time because he's the same way. He's like, "We're gonna do this one simple. We're gonna let's do old school. Let's only do eight tracks, and then we have by the end of the day we have forty eight tracks and this layer and that layer and." <laughs> and, and and I can't make a record sound like that that spacious Mellencamp thing. And so I've always wondered if it was just the limitations that created that magic. You know, that's a, a that's a great question. I can't answer you. Yeah, um, I think a lot of it is just perception. But allow me to digress one second. The last record that I did as an artist, and this is going to blow your mind. Bruce Fairbairn was my producer and Bob Rock was my engineer. Really? Ready for that? And when was that? That was 1988. I was in a band called Shanghai, which sold zero records uh, <laughs> on Chrysalis. Did, did you do it up in Canada at, at Bruce's place? No, we, we did it at um, uh, in New York at Power Station. And then we mixed it in at Little Mountain in Vancouver. Oh, right on, right on. That's amazing. The three of you making music together. Yeah, how about that? <laughs> and did you guys get along? Did you? Oh yeah, you... love the love those guys. And then Bruce had me come back 
to do um oh fuck who who was the singer that did Louis 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 Louis, Louis, Louis. I I know hmm. I can't say who it is but I okay well anyway he did a solo album and and I wrote the uh the lead song called Living in Fiction oh right on right on and uh and they flew me into I sang background vocals or some bullshit like that but it but yeah. no they were great friends great friends I I do you have a picture of the three of you guys together I probably do somewhere that's but, that's worth a million bucks to me, man. That's nothing I can cool. think of. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. Go ahead, Joe. Awesome. I, I awesome. dominated this, and and I I could go on for four more hours. And we have I know we could keep we could keep going on. Well, we uh, need to do this about the Warrant records too. Those guys yeah. in Warrant are like my best friends. They're like, oh. and, and I know I you know I know what what Joey and Eric did and didn't do. They they've been very honest about that in, in their lives. With but uh, but um. What great, I know this is about Rat, but what a gifted, gifted lyricist Janie Lane was. Would, would oh. you agree with that? <laughs> Without question. Yeah. Without question. I always told Janie, I said, if, if you ever don't want to be a rock and roll singer anymore, you should be a Baptist preacher. Right, right. <laughs> and then, and what, what, what was that song, I Saw Red? and. Yeah. If the sun should ever fail to shine its light, we could burn a thousand candles and make everything all right. Like, no, like, no offense, but Stephen and Vince and Brett weren't writing anything like that. No, <laughs> you know what I'm, Yeah, what a what a what a magic, um, what a magic bunch of stories, Jamie. Yeah, wrote. we'll have to do. We'll, we should do a warrant. warrant okay. Version of this. Yes. Whenever you guys like. Yeah. 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 Now let me ask yeah. you this with closing boat. Sure. There's been rumors of Rat, you know, reuniting and all that kind of stuff. Would you ever do another Rat record if all their guys got back? Uh, would I ever do another Rat record if they all got back? Um, would you ever take pins and stick them in your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> well, he said at the very beginning that Robin was the glue. Yeah, and Robin... I know, I know. And you can tell that kind of in yeah. the music. Well, yeah. listen, to be honest, uh, uh, Stephen and I had kind of stayed in touch ish over the years, um, and and I haven't stayed in touch with any of the other guys at all. So, uh, you know, I, th I think the chance the ch it's an interesting concept, but I think the chances of that happening are pretty remote. Um, I think the chances of those guys getting back together again are also pretty remote based on some never of the, the acrimony that I've heard about. It's never going to happen. And plus, Warren came from money and then married the Mars family, who he married the daughter of the Mars Empire, the Candy, yeah. you know, who lives out, lives 30 miles from me. I'm in Virginia. But um, and uh, Warren doesn't, from what I understand, he doesn't, he just, he doesn't care enough to 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 want to. No, Warren Warren is wearing a, a smoking jacket and hush puppies. So, <laughs> yeah. so. Oh, well, we'll see, we'll see. And you didn't say no. Age. You didn't well, say no. No, I didn't say no. <laughs> Joe, listen, if if you've got a little inside track on that, hey, at least you know, drop me an email and tell me what what's going on. <laughs> but you know, that's. Uh, Bobby is not making that, direct. That ship has kind has kind of sailed. And the <laughs> other thing is just the, the the condition of the of the industry right now is not really conducive to us, you know, getting into a new enterprise because the you know the monetization of the way that everything is going right now That's is right. I can't I don't get it. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand it. My my royalty statements are this thick with fractions of a penny <laughs> you you still own all your stuff right you didn't sell any like a lot of people do do you did you no uh, okay. i've i've got my stuff yeah and but you know again it's it's mailbox money to me glad to get it you know shocked that it's lasted this long <laughs> sure and uh, honestly 
uh, but no, I mean, it's, it doesn't, it's not making the difference in my life plus or yeah. minus one way or another. It's just, it's great to talk to guys like you and, um, people that are interested in that little snapshot of time, which is really crazy. I was talking to my wife tonight about it and, and, and she said, oh, don't forget you have, you have that interview at, uh, at eight o'clock. And then she said, why do people still give a shit about this stuff and i went i don't know but they really do i mean there's a hunger for it and people I, I, would, it. I would say more so than anything and yeah. you know tom tom werman's out on the fucking circuit right now like he's a giant celebrity himself like you know what i mean he just released that book and everyone's talking to werman and hearing his stories and stuff like that and and uh he, you know it, it's it you know this this year alone well you know Poison and Def Leppard and and Motley Crue went out and did, filled sold out stadiums a couple of years ago. I don't know if you keep up on that. They did that stadium tour, and they sold out stadiums. And then our solo band with Brett this summer, we did it was called the Party Girl Tour, and um, we did amphitheaters. Joe came. Uh, we we were in front of crowds as thirty five forty thousand people every night. It, it there's there's a love for it still. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, there is. Well, apparently so. I mean, the last gig that I went to was last September and and I flew out for the final kicks show in you were at Mary Weather. Sorry? You were at Mary Weather. You were there. Oh, absolutely I was there. I wouldn't you missed that one, didn't you, Pete? Oh, but, and, but, uh, um, I got I, I I have to tell you. Bo, I, you and you and me, it's 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 interesting. Is um so uh when 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 Steve left Kicks and did Funny Money, mm -hmm. I was I produced the first single they ever did. Really? Yes. Uh, I had a studio in Manassas, Virginia. He was from Hagerstown, West Virginia. Right. And, right. Um. They they the band started by doing a cheap trick cover for a compilation record and i was i had my parents i was very young and my parents had mortgage took a second mortgage out of their house and gave me the money to build a studio in manassas virginia a real studio not like in my basement you know what i mean right, so I, right. I rented a warehouse out and i built this this facility and it was it was the time of adats and da88s the task md 88s and right. i I built this room and, but being, we grew up where I grew up, Kicks was our Van Halen. Like in all regards, if you weren't as good as Kicks, don't even talk to us. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And, and so I was so excited to produce Steve Whiteman, engineer Steve Whiteman. They were self-produced and I'll never forget. He came in and he sang this track and I hit the talk back. And I was just trying to be professional. Steve, that was great. Would you like to come in and listen? No, I got it. Just double it. His confidence, I've never seen anything like that in my entire yeah. life. You know what yeah. I mean? And you made Kicks Records, right? Midnight yeah. Dynamite, right? Yeah. Then Midnight Dynamite, and then I just did a remix of Midnight Dynamite and um, the next one. What was the next one after that? Well, um, my views. Yeah. So they sent me all the masters from 30 years ago and I remixed both those records last so, year. Okay. But I want to ask you when I made that record that day, the guitar player was a guy named Billy Andrews. That was just a local guy. I don't know if you've ever met him or not. And Billy said to me to get rid of the lisp problem, you whisper a track and that you would blend the whisper in against Steve's voice. You're shaking your head. That's, that is really how that happened? Yes. That's amazing. I've always <laughs> wondered. But, I mean, we did it that day. We did it, and it worked. But I got chills right now just talking to you about that. <laughs> that, that, is, that is amazing. But my okay. Point, my, so my, here, here was the deal. Steve had a tooth that came out of the roof of his mouth. Uh-huh. Like freak show stuff. And yeah, and we did a whisper track. That's amazing. So we had played, I forget where my band had played, but you were basically 
blacklist if you didn't go to that kicks gig that last gig and my gets my rhythm guitar player in the brett michaels band was in funny money and we're all just it's a local it's it, it we're a tight-knit group and we got stuck in the airport in denver we were all flying we had a gig somewhere and we were flying back to see the kick show and we got delayed a half hour we got delayed another hour and so when i landed I was like, I can't fucking get there. I landed at Dulles Airport. I don't know where you would have flown into, but I landed at Dulles and uh, I said, fuck it. I'm not going to make it. I'll be an asshole. And I thought we all agreed to that. All of us in the band were like, we're not going to make it. And our fucking other guitar player found a way to get up there and made us all look like douchebags because he got there for the last two songs. Oh, <laughs> listen, it was, it was true. Because I, I see these guys like, you know, every year or so. I saw them in Vegas a couple times. Uh -huh. But this was like Queen. I mean, it was like, you know, when I saw Queen at Live Aid, it was like unbelievable. 14,000 people. The The place was just, was just crazy. And these guys brought it like they always do. Every time. And, and it just, it just thrilled my heart. I can't even tell you. It just, it thrilled my heart to death. Never a bad, never. A, and, you know, Brett is from Pennsylvania. And when I joined Brett's band 20 years ago, the first question out of his fucking mouth was because he hired my whole band. My my own band became the solo band. First question out of his mouth is, can you do like kicks does? I said, what do you fucking mean? He goes, can you be like kicks? That's how impactful they were to yeah. everyone on the East Coast. You, you know what I mean? And, and it's it's funny because they've had... I know it's over now, but the last 10 years have been a better career for them than, than yeah. the heyday or, you know? Yeah. Oh man, Bo, what an, I forgot that you had done those kicks records. Forgive me. I hope that's not an insult to you. I just, I forgot. God damn. Those records sound good too, man. Fuck. <laughs> well, no, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll do, we'll talk some more records. Okay. Man. Whenever you guys like want to, I will, I will certainly, uh, make myself available. I love chatting with you guys about this stuff so and, fun. Uh, and all the interconnectivity. It's, yeah. it's all. Good. One last question before we go. Sure. In 2023, if you could do anything right now with anybody, what would it be? Is there anything you hunger to do? Someone to work with something to make? We already answered that Pete. It was rat. No, he, <laughs> he said not. He said he'd rather have pins in his eyes. No, he didn't say no that. though. <laughs> <laughs> no no jo joe says it would be rat okay so it, would be, it would be rat right no, and if it wasn't rat or if if rat didn't want to work with me again for the ninth time <laughs> i would do peter gabriel sting acdc zz top interesting Billy Gibbons. What, one night one night in new york we were doing this benefit and uh, a bunch of different artists and Billy Gibbons was there and he had, they had used a backline amp and he didn't like the amp. And he came up to me and he said, can I, uh, can I just hear your amp? He's so nice. It's fucking Billy Gibbons. It's goddamn Billy Gibbons. And like, am I going to tell him no? And uh, so, and are you, where, where do you live, Bo? Austin. Oh, you live in Austin? Yeah. Oh man, my guitar player, my band was just in Austin last week. Uh, such a small, so everything's weird. But anyway, um, I said, yes, Billy, you can play my amp. And he goes, oh, that's great. Uh, it was an orange, a little orange amp, a little orange thing that I was using. And uh, he goes, can I use your amp tonight? Uh, first of all, am I going to tell Billy Gibbons no, right? Anyway, I fucking shipped that motherfucker home and it's in my closet and I've never touched it since. <laughs> Billy got to okay. <laughs> So I, I know we're, we're trying to wrap up, but I've got to tell you guys this. Please, yeah. please. Okay. Now, I, I've known Billy for a long time. Uh-huh. And we had two friends when, when we first moved to Austin, which was in 2007. And I had two friends in from California, and we were driving them back to the airport. And we were early, and I said, well, you guys want to go downtown and see downtown and uh, we'll go to the Four Seasons, have a glass of wine. Yeah, sure. So we get to the Four Seasons. Um, we're walking in and the guy in front of me, my friend, he said, I think that was the guitar player from ZZ Top. <laughs> so we're doing this, right? 
And, and I turn around and come outside the building and I turn my head and I go, Billy? And he turned around and he looked at me and he said, Bo? <laughs> I said, what's up, man? And uh, you want to come join us for a glass of wine? And he did. So we're sitting in the uh, lobby of the Four Seasons and my wife who is not a rock person at all. She has no fucking clue what I've done in my life <laughs> at all. So we're sitting at the table, our two friends from California, my wife, myself, and Billy. And then my wife turns around to Billy and she goes, so how do you know Bo? Are you like a drummer or are you like a band? <laughs> That's amazing. That's great. And I'm telling you, it, it was the whole place went like EF Hutton. It, it was like, what? That's amazing. <laughs> and, but, but, you know, and Billy, he was so cool about it. And I said, uh, you know, after I finished swallowing my tongue, I went, uh, no, honey, he's the guy that sings that song, LaGrange, that you like so much. And as soon as I said that, Billy, on cue, like it was a movie script, turned around to my wife and said, they got a lot of nice girls down there. <laughs> um, I swear to God. I swear oh, to God. There's no way you would make that up. But why would you? You can't make that up. <laughs> you can't make it up. All right. This is the last question, and then we're done. Okay. Of that genre, of the 80s genre, what record that you didn't make do you wish you had made or you think is great? Um. that I didn't make. Well, I would probably say I would probably say uh, Owner of Lonely Heart. Um, yes, that's a great yeah. sound record. Oh, it was incredible. It, it was, I, I listened to it a million times. I can't tell you today how many, every tour I go on, what, whoever our opening bands are or different things, sound engineers still pump that record through the PA when they're dialing it in. And the, you know what I mean? It, I mean, great record, great engineering, great production, great arrangement. I mean, I just, I, I loved it. I wish. So, by the way, I'm a gigantic, of all bands, it's Van Halen, right? And I'm a Hagar guy. Hagar through and through. And yeah. I wish you would have made a Van Halen record and fixed that fucking nasty snare drum of Alex's. Okay. I, I, I didn't like I the snare. Be I'd be down for that. <laughs> That's what I would have liked. So anyway, what an honor, Bo. I thank you for taking this time. I don't even know what to say, man. I, I Like I said, I my heroes are my friends these days. I'm the luckiest guy in the world with the career that Brett's given me. I, I, I text Ace Freely all the time, and Ace is my guitar hero, and I and the guys in Warrant are my friends, and 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 to include you that I've 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 made your acquaintance is um, it, it's it's amazing to me. Thank you for the time. All right, but we'll be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Great Bye, talking. Thank Thanks, you. Joe. All right. Thank you. you. Bye.